Thank you, thank you. Um, Gloria, uh, your story is very familiar to me. <laughs> yes. Very, very familiar. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Hughes, and I am the uh, acting warden of the California Institution for Women in Chino. I would like to say that I am um, grateful to be here today, and I want to thank um, Shirley Smith and her team for inviting me here today. Uh, I want to acknowledge all our distinguished guests, and I also want to acknowledge the um, the previous warden of CIW is here, Mr. Garcia. <laughs> He looks good, and that's probably because he's retired. <laughs> I also want to thank my administrative assistant, um, Montez, for bringing me here today. I appreciate you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I am um, probably older than I look. Uh, this young, young man in front said, uh, he was shocked they let somebody so young run the prison. <laughs> I told him I'm not as young as he thinks. But I grew up in Los Angeles uh, with both my parents, my mother and father, and five siblings. Um, I was educated in the Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, I did attend uh, San Diego State University, and I graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in um, Administrative Justice. Uh, I am married. I have two wonderful daughters. Uh, my oldest will turn 27 on November 1st, and my baby is nine. <laughs> and I have no children in between. <laughs> Just those two girls, those are my babies. Uh, I have been with the California Department of Corrections for 23 years. I started my career in 1990 at Richard J. Donovan down in San Diego. I left there in 92 and went to Calipatria State Prison in Imperial County. Uh, I stayed there down in the desert approximately 18 years, uh, moving up through the ranks. I had an opportunity to be a parole agent for two years from 2004 to 2006. In um, October 2006, I went to Chuckawalla Valley State Prison in Blythe. Uh, as a captain. In 2010, I came to California Rehabilitation Center in Norco as an associate warden. I became the uh, chief deputy warden at Norco. And on October 1st, 2013, I am the acting warden of California Institution for Women. <laughs> Although this is my fifth institution, it is the first opportunity I have been given to work with female offenders. Um, it is a different experience. However, I wake up every morning excited to go to work. Uh, I do believe I have stepped into my purpose to be here with the females. My institution, I have approximately 1,900 women there. Um, 290 of those are serving life terms. Uh, I have approximately 257 women cur currently at our three fire camps. Uh, within the prison, I have a 45-bed psychiatric inpatient unit known as the PIP, which opened in 2012. I have an administrative segregation unit, a security housing unit, a psychiatric services unit. Some of our programs offered for women are uh, adult basic education, which allows them to earn their GED high school diploma, several college programs, literacy programs, enhanced visiting, uh, parental bonding. Our vocational training includes computer training, data processing, word processing, electronics, building maintenance, our popular cosmetology and manicuring, and a physical fitness training to prepare our ladies to fight at our fire camps. Uh, additionally, on the campus, we have Prison Industry Authority, known as PIA. Uh, it is our clothing and textile manufacturing, where they make shirts, shorts, jeans, smocks, aprons, bedspreads, boxer shorts, handkerchiefs, bandanas, and nomad fire, uh, firefighting clothing. One of the things at CIW we value is communication, responsibility, professionalism, an interdisciplinary approach, programming, training, and safety and security, of course. Our core values are integrity, 
respect, innovation, and teamwork. I have committed myself and my staff to be a positive force in our community. Me and my staff, we attend the School Attendance Re Review Board in San Bernardino County known as SARB. I do understand the powerful impact our presence has on partnering with the school district in our attempts to lower the truancy rate within our community. Many of the inmates I have spoken to are too familiar with the SAR process. Um, it has a direct impact and began their delinquent behavior starts in school and truancy. Um, my goal, if we can, is to change at least one or two kids to go to school not become truant and not become part of the prison system. Today, um, thank you Shirley, we're back there, because uh, I asked, I said, what exactly do you want me to tell uh, the audience about the prison and me and so forth? And a lot of things came to my mind about the prison. Um, one of the things that crossed my mind is um, how do I begin to talk about the mothers that are behind the bars? What exactly are these women and who are these women that I see every day? I speak to them every day, I feed them every day, I watch them every day and I count them every day. But what I didn't know is who, who they really were. Who, who are the women that I see walking around the institution? Um, one thing I do know is the labels that society has given them, but um, who are they really? I figured the only way to find out who they were was to go directly to the source and just ask them. So what I did is randomly selected several women at the institution, uh, a diverse group, and I assembled them together, and I wanted to talk to them about some things they perhaps wanted me to share with you today. One of the things um, that they talked to me about were most everyone that I spoke with had children in our foster care system. They too were products of the foster care system themselves. Um, one of the things that the ladies wanted to share with me, one of the things that I wanted to do was my initial plan was just to go in, spend about an hour with them, ask them a couple of questions and uh, find out a little, some things of how they were feeling and so forth. My plan didn't work. After almost three hours of listening through their tears and allowing them to really speak and express themselves, I had an opportunity to hear the hearts of those ladies. They are mothers and one of the things I found out is that they love their children just as much as I love my children. So they kind of touched me, <laughs> well they did. The courage it took for them to tell me their stories and what has happened to them, I found it simply amazing. I found it unbelievable and I was surprised at how and what they have actually survived. I do want to share you a couple of things that they did tell me. One of the first things that I realized is that not only do they tru truly love their children, but they also admitted that the behavior and the things that they have done, such as hustling, stealing, the unhealthy relationships they were in, really wasn't for their kids. It was because they said they don't know how to begin to love themselves. And they don't know how to act, and most of the things they act is out of emotion because they, growing up in a system, they had a very poor self-image of themselves. Um, they accepted abuse from anybody. As children, it was, they couldn't help it, but as adults, they grew to accept this kind of abuse because they felt it was normal for them. One of the things they said is, of course, the drugs masked, masked their pain and helped them cope with what was going on in their lives or the abuse bestowed upon them as children. And therefore, it just became easy to accept abuse as adults. They did feel abandoned, stripped of their self-esteem. They had no confidence from being placed in placement. And they said placement and being placed in foster home made prison feel comfortable to them. 
because that's all they knew. All they knew was systems and being in a system or having parameters. So that's why it felt comfortable. One of the ladies I spoke with, she was a third generation foster care and now her children are the fourth generation in our foster care system. They believe sometimes the courts look through them and down on them because of their past. And then they began to believe that they're just not good enough to be in their child's life. So they end up giving up the fight for their children sometimes when they really don't want to. Several stated that they have tattoos on their face. And the reason for the tattoos is because they want to hide themselves because they really don't know who they are inside. One stated to me she grew up playing a character. She had to become a character every time the social worker came. She had to dress herself up, she had to act good, she had to play someone she's not. So to this day, she sits there not knowing who she is because she has played so many different roles and so many different people. One of the things that they also stated is that um, sometimes they don't feel equipped or nor do they have a work ethic because they've never seen one demonstrated in their life. Their greatest fear is not wanting their children to feel unwanted or unloved. One of the ladies expressed to me her 12-year-old daughter wants to commit a crime to come to prison just so she could be with her mother. There are some wonderful foster care parents and I want to applaud the foster care parents who are out there or if you know of some and I commend their commitment to these children who are longing for their mother. I do not take my job lightly, but I am ready for the challenge that is presented before me. I am committed to encouraging them and to challenging them to be better women. I speak on their behalf. I'm examining my self-help programs to ensure that we are meeting the needs of the women to be successful in society. I currently have a wonderful social worker on ground who loves what she does, and she's committed to coordinating visit visitation, reunification, referrals upon release, providing advocacy services, child searches, and other services. What I want to leave with you is this. I believe the women of CIW and those women I have spoke with displayed courage and they trusted me with the innermost pain, the personal pain that they had. And I have an awesome responsibility to show up for them every day. What I saw in these women were courage, so I looked up the word courage. Webster defines courage as the lack of fear, bravery, or valor. And pretty much, that's what sum up how I'm going to lead CIW. Finally, I want to close with how I see the women of CIW. My ladies, they choose to constantly and consistently complete courses and curriculum contained and constructed within the confines and corridors of a correctional facility. They are curious, coordinating, creative creatures, confounded by one's own criticism and cruel situation, yet commands their current circumstance not to consume or compare to the commitment and challenge they made for themselves. They are change and a certified change agent, given a new chance counter with character and a comeback. They have open opportunities and options to overcome any obstacles thrown their way. They are original, outspoken, and outgoing women who are overcoming the opinions of others. They will be ready to unleash and unlock the utmost unknown under the umbrella of understanding. They will develop a universal, unique, urgent, unbreakable, unshakable quest upward. I believe they I believe they will relieve, they will be relieved from recklessness, rebellion, and regret, and recapture your respect and accept responsibilities to reasonably realize they are recognized, refreshed, renewed, reformed, remarkable, and rehabilitated. Although sometimes anxious with anxiety, they adequately adjust accurately, advancing forward among adversaries, promoting their own agenda again. They will not act with aggression, but remain an all-star. My ladies are enlightened and an earnest effort of 
of endurance, energy, expression, extreme exhaustion. They will exceed expectations as excellent examples. And you should be excited because I am. Those are my ladies of CIW.